guys, Mr. Awful Waffles here. This is my completely unprofessional and poorly scripted review of the darkest short- Nope, that's not the map name. <laughs> the Shadowed Throne. I keep making that mistake. I mean, I said it was unscripted or at least poorly scripted. I meant it, guys. Now, some disclaimers. I'm going to be talking about the co-op experience in this video because, as far as I'm concerned, solo games in World War II are objectively worse than co-op. The developers do not scale requirements down for various steps in the easter eggs dependent on how many players you have in the game, and as such, everything in co-op is just more smooth as far as I'm concerned. I hope this changes, but, I mean, because that's the way it is, that's going to be reflected in what I'm talking about today. I'll also be prioritizing discussion of things like easter eggs over talk about high rounds or public matches or anything like that, simply because that's what I enjoy doing in the game. So, let's get into it. General Gameplay! Okay, first off, there's a lot that's actually changed since The Darkest Shore that applies to all of World War II. There's been a red screen update, there's also been a health regen time update, and paint jobs are in-game now as well, so I can put waffle camos on all my guns and make it all a bit more interesting. And that has definitely changed my experience of World War II Zombies, and thus this map as well, for the better. So that is worth noting. Now, jumping into the map for the first time, it's very easy to see why people compare the aesthetic to Garod Krovi. From the general look of the buildings surrounding you as you move through the space, to the placement of one of the perks on a kind of elevated balcony thing, exactly as you see in Garod, it's the same damn thing, I swear. JC even confirmed it for me, and we all know that I'm pretty sure Garod Krovi is one of JC's parents, so he's kind of an authority on that kind of thing. The map is actually bright, which is super nice, like super duper nice, and the air is clear. And it's such a massive relief after experiencing the dinginess of the Final Reich and the fogginess of Darkest Shore. I maintain, fog is not and has never been fun. It just isn't. And that goes for maps like Call of the Dead, which is a fan favorite, as well as the obvious ones like Transit or Darkest Shore. I just do not like fog, I like visibility, and this map has plenty of it, which I enjoy greatly. There are also several areas of the map that are nice to explore and just enjoyable to be in because they're visually interesting. For example, the museum is great. That room alone is probably more enjoyable aesthetically than the entirety of TDS, The Darkest Shore. It's great because I actually feel motivated to go in there and look at things and go, oh man, that's grotesque, or why the hell were they doing these experiments, or just things like that which I did not get in Darkest Shore at all, bar the one Corpse Gate area. Other than that, Darkest Shore, in my opinion, was pretty uninteresting, and to be honest, Mittelberg was as well for TFR, but this map, in my opinion, has improved on that. The layout and flow is also really good for quick traversal, nothing really feels horribly far away at any given time, and it was also really nice to see that achieved in a map that didn't have a transit system. There's no reliance here on a tram, no reliance on sewer chutes or anything along those lines. You just run around and it feels good. Because of all of this, I feel much happier to actually just go through rounds in this map than I have done in some of the previous maps for World War II. It's just, I don't know, easier to play and less of a chore because I can actually see and because I can actually see, I can take in the surroundings a little bit better, enjoy it all a little bit more, and nothing feels quite as oppressive. With all of that said, I now want to discuss a couple of pain points, and one of them is that Whistlers are still in this map. God damn it, no one likes them! Okay, so granted, they feel a lot less ham-fisted than they did in a map like TDS. However, I would much rather that, instead of just pasting Whistlers into every single map, Sledgehammer spent their time developing a new enemy type that could replace them with similar kind of effects in-game. They've kind of tried to do this, I suppose, by adding Sizzlers into this map, which are created by the blimp that floats above you when you're doing the main quest. And this would be a nice and welcome addition in theory, but it actually ends up just being annoying because of the way Sizzlers are designed 
When you have a final zombie in a given round, if it's a regular zombie, it can get turned into a sizzler by the blimp above you, and when that happens, it runs faster than you do, so it takes all your armor away and just eventually downs you, unless you kill it. It runs faster than the player pretty much invariably. And that is just not fun. And so, we've got the copy-paste of the Whistlers, and now we have a new enemy type, which is just annoying and nothing else, and it kinda just leaves me wanting more. You can mitigate the annoyance of the Sizzlers by saving pests or bombies with their bombs shot off, because then the blimp can't turn them into Sizzlers, it can't turn special enemy types, but I feel it's just an annoying gameplay quirk that I don't think really adds to the experience in any way. The Pack-a-Punch in the map is also still uninteresting, it's a copy-paste machine design from the previous two maps, and the Pap Camo is reused AGAIN! And this, in my opinion, is inexcusable. They've given us a side quest camos in this map, they gave us side quest camos for a limited time in the previous map, and they've got all sorts of camos in World War II, and yet, the Pap Camo in this map is the same boring, silvery soup that it has been for the last two maps, and in my opinion, it's just not good enough. I like the fact that Pap is fairly easy to access, it's not particularly crazy or tedious, but I just wish we had a new camo. Bleed out times on the map are also horrendously fast in my opinion, but I think this will be fixed in patches most likely. And one final point as far as pain points go, it's unfortunate to see no new perks. We're still working with the stuff that we've already seen. I guess a caveat to this is that now that we're pretty much 10 years deep into zombies as a game mode, it is difficult to imagine innovation in this area that would be actually fun to play with, but when the consumable system in World War II Zombies is so atrociously bad, it really does make me wish that we had a new perk to just liven things up a little bit. Speaking of consumables, we didn't get any new consumables or new mods or anything with the release of this map pack, as far as I have seen, and that's a disappointment too, because like I've just said, the consumable system sucks, it would have been really nice to get a couple new mods to freshen up the gameplay a little bit, and just generally I think that World War II has a lot to improve in this area. So usually, I am head over heels invested in Zombies lore. All of you know that, really I don't need to say it. But sadly, World War II has continued to fail to hook me in. There are elements of The Shadowed Throne that I imagine do contain some story and that there is room for exploration in, but I just don't have the pull to do that exploration and to theorize about everything in the same way that I did back with maps like Verrucht, Shinonuma, and Deriz in World at War. Despite the fact that both games really are using the same subject matter, the core premise is Nazi experimentation, creating the undead, and going wrong. And I loved it in World at War and was instantly invested, but this time, not so much. I don't know, maybe I'm just getting too old for this or something. The intro and outro cutscenes on the map are also visually appetizing, I've got to give them that, but bar that, they're devoid of any substance whatsoever. They've got questionable acting in them, and animation or animation, I don't know what's the problem, but I really haven't got any satisfaction from them for this map. And on top of that, I'm yet to hear any character conversations in-game that are even remotely interesting for Shadowed Throne, and that's a disappointment for me as well. I really think that the story here has so much potential, but so far I've been kind of disappointed in the execution, I suppose. The couple of things that they've done, for example, during the boss fight of this map, there's a development with Straub, which I won't mention in case you're going to play it and you haven't yet, but that was really cool. That was a little bit of whiplash that I wasn't expecting and I enjoyed. But the greater narrative definitely has room for improvement, and I don't think it's improvement in terms of the writing, it's more in terms of the way it's conveyed. Easter eggs, brother! Okay, so for this bit, let's take a look at what makes a good Easter egg, and then determine how Shadowed Throne shapes up. First off, let's talk about player motivation. Is there much player motivation, for example, to complete the Easter egg? Is the player forced into the quest as a mandatory aspect of their play session, like you have in Origins, for instance? 
in my opinion, Shadow Throne finds a pretty good balance here. This is actually, in my opinion, overall, a really good Easter egg quest. A significant chunk of the quest can be completed in the first 5 to 10 rounds of the game, and they give you instant rewards in the form of the Wonder Bus, that's the Wonder Weapon on the map, as well as further melee Wonder Weapons. The weapons are powerful enough to justify the time taken to unlock them, and exciting to use thanks to some cool effects and animations. The ability to recharge the Wonder Bus by firing a charging bolt into zombies with L2 is particularly nice to see, and it encourages smart play as well. As far as the melee weapons go, the knife is amazing because if you've got full health and you stab a zombie using the knife's heavy attack, you actually get a chunk of your armor back, and that is just super cool to see in my opinion. Again, encouraging smart play. It's good stuff. Now, is the quest's narrative well designed? Well, easter egg steps often, in Treyarch maps, in ExoZombies maps, all over the place, they just throw puzzles at the player because they are challenging, or they're designed to burn through rounds. Now, TST is guilty of this in a couple of areas. The Wonder Weapon Baseball Bat, for example, requires three rounds to pass before it can be acquired. This wouldn't be the end of the world if it was the only thing like this in the map, but unfortunately there are a couple more examples such as when you're charging the rabbit soul box for the knife melee weapon. There's also an extremely egregious soul box, in my opinion, in the form of the weapon molds that you need to charge before you do the statue puzzle. They basically mean that the player either burns through several rounds filling them up with the different zombies required because it goes regular zombies, then sizzlers, and then pests, and so to get all of those you could just burn through rounds like crazy, especially for those sizzlers and pests, or to try and avoid round burn you can hoard the same group of zombies for about 10 minutes and just have them all one by one turned into sizzlers by the blimp above you. But that's just a jarring tempo change for the quest, and as such, I really wish they'd executed this bit a little differently. However, while TST suffers from that same soulbox crutch that so many other maps have succumbed to, it makes up for it with some brilliant puzzle design and narrative influence. For example, the Smuggler quest is one of my favourite eggs in a very long time, and I call it an egg because really it is a mini quest contained within the major quest. It's very simple, but it gives the player a reason to actually care about the puzzle that needs to be solved, and it has a fun outcome at the end as we trace the smuggler's story while we play. The steps are reasonably logical, and figuring out what to do didn't rely on just a war of attrition of players just playing the map over and over again until someone happened to stumble on the steps. It wasn't reliant on player volume. An extremely bad example of that kind of approach would be Gorod Krovi with its puzzle strike step and things like that. Now, the smuggler steps do involve some RNG, but it's manageable. Similarly, the statue puzzle step is fantastic. So, so good. The puzzle starts with a simpler case of the main puzzle, with three statues to solve, before increasing the difficulty to four statues on the remaining walls. Once the player gets wall one, they are well equipped to continue the puzzle. The solved state of having all statues facing the player is also more obvious and better communicated than, say, the solved state of the Garod Krovi air valves, where people didn't know what the game's desired end state was upon solution. It just wasn't made clear. People were mixed up with the green light and the codex and things like that. In this case with the statues, the simplified first wall helps avoid this air valve issue because it's more likely that a confused player will stumble on the correct solution in the easy case and then be able to apply what they have learned to the following walls, whereas Garod offered no learning process, it just threw you in and expected a solution. I can imagine that figuring this out in-game for some people might seem like it's far too difficult, but honestly, if you like puzzles, and I mean, that's why a lot of us are attracted to easter eggs in the first place, I think that you should try and avoid using a solver for this, for example I've got one on chronorium.com made by Javano, 
you should avoid using that and just give it a go yourself because it is really satisfying to figure out. The step after that though with the ravens, I don't get right now, I don't know why it is the way it is, it's just a bit weird, but hey, you can't win them all. The boss fight in the egg is a definite improvement on the fight from, for example, the darkest shore, but it still leaves something to be desired for player feedback. For example, it can be confusing when the boss is or isn't damageable, as glowing parts of its body mislead the player into thinking it's vulnerable when it isn't. So you can be shooting into the guy and nothing can happen, and then seemingly nothing can change and suddenly he's taking damage. In my opinion, the visual cues could be better here. The way you get into the boss fight is really smart, having that pod drop down and then bring you up to the zeppelin, that is awesome, I really like that as a mechanism for transporting the player, and they do a nice bit of little game design trickery that you've seen in games such as Portal 2 in the past, whereby you're inside an elevator, and you don't know that there's a loading screen, but what I'm sure they're doing when they make you look up and fire into that fuse for the entire duration of your Wonder Weapon ammo count is distracting you from the fact that it's essentially trying to load in that blimp section of the map as quickly as possible. I also quite like that build-up section when you do arrive in the boss fight arena for the first time, which culminates in that little narrative beat featuring Dr. Straub, which I mentioned previously. It's a fun way of showing us something without leaning on cutscenes as has been done in previous maps, and is a nice little quirk to the boss fight as well. One further point that I would like to make about the boss fight is that I don't think it's massively clear that the Wonder Weapon needs to be used to kill the boss, Personally, I think that it would have been nice to have that signposted a little more clearly, or something in that area, but uh, at the end of the day, it's not the biggest thing in the world that they do it as they do currently. The time the community took to solve the egg was much better than maps like Rave and, I mean, obviously the final Reich. I would have liked a slightly longer hunt. I think that something a bit closer to like a DE would have been ideal, and in this case would have helped the longer term life of the mode. But I can't really complain seeing as the community was never really stuck on a stupidly designed step as happened in, for example, Buried, or one that was straight up not working, as happened in maps like Revelations, or Garod, or Zetsubo where you had people crashing before they got to the boss fights, or Darkest Shore where the Whistler would constantly get stuck. The quest reward remains completely unsatisfying though. Having all perks is not interesting, especially because perks in World War II Zombies aren't interesting by their very nature of the way they're designed which leads to a player mentality of, we've just finished the easter egg, now let's just kill ourselves. And I think that finding ways to avoid that and keep people playing after they've finished the egg would be a significant improvement for the game. But that's a problem that affects all of zombies, really. The end cutscene, like I mentioned previously, was divisive too, in that it didn't really give us any kind of interesting nod towards the upcoming DLC 3 map, and I think that that's a shame. Side quests. The very first thing I did in game on TST was go to the radio and enter the numbers 38.9 and 39.3. I did this because of information that had been released on callofduty.com slash classified a few days before the map came out, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that it unlocked for me a pretty awesome looking secret camo called Thule's Errand. This, in my opinion, is a really cool way to keep people invested in the external resources that Sledge are using to promote their game, it's easy enough to do that pretty much everybody should end up with it, and generally, it's a very easy addition that I'm very happy with. There's also a Hangman quest on the map, which allows players to unlock Wonder Weapons from the previous two maps, and this is a really fun addition too. You can also spawn in all of the game's power-up drops by playing Hangman, and as far as I'm concerned, this is an awesome addition to the game. It's literally just a game of Hangman, it's not any more complex than that, but it's a testament to the work of the Sledgehammer Games team. There's also a quest requiring five hats to be stacked on a cheetah statue, but sadly, the only reward for this is giving the player all of those same spawned power-ups again. 
and this reward repetition only serves to make me less invested in Sledgehammer side quests in the future. They really need to work on rewards. Just giving us audio logs or drops isn't really going to cut it, in my opinion. So, overall, the side quests have a lot of character, especially the jump scare, for example, which I got JC with, and it was glorious. If you come over to the little woman here, uh, and uh, just go hold square on the, on the woman real quick. Wow, this is so, so uh, beautiful. You, you, no, hold, hold so beautiful. Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, Jesus Christ! Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> I was waiting for it. That's not part of the main quest, but gotcha. <laughs> I do wish that those side quests were a little more rewarding. They are still significantly improved in this map, though, compared to, for example, the Darkest Shore. Final word. I think this map deserves your playtime, if only to see how Sledgehammer has improved since TFR and TDS. They still have a long way to go to reach the god tier status that certain Treyarch maps like Der Eisendrache have achieved, but I can at least say this map is good and really mean it, which I couldn't really do for a map like Darkest Shore. I wouldn't necessarily recommend Darkest Shore to someone on the fence about whether they wanted to buy the Season Pass, but this map I would recommend, and hopefully this trend is going to continue as we get deeper into the DLC cycle and the maps only get better and better. I think that ultimately this should have been DLC 1, it's a shame that it wasn't, but I'm excited to see where Sledgehammer takes things as we get towards the culmination of their World War II Zombies story. So, how was that, guys? I've never really done a map review like this before. I figured that there were so many people asking me whether they should even buy it that I could kind of give some insight into it and hopefully help those people make their decision. And fingers crossed it's been enjoyable for those of you that aren't interested in World War II at all or are really enjoying the map and still playing it right now as you listen to this video. If you've enjoyed it and you want to see this sort of thing from me in the future with other DLC maps and especially as we go into Black Ops 4 Zombies, then please leave a like on the video and leave a comment supporting that idea because if there's no support for it, I probably won't do it. I've been Mr. Off Waffles, thank you so much for watching the video and I will see you next time. Subscribe as well, by the way, and turn on notifications. How many more times am I going to say that? Dearie me. Okay, see you later, guys. Bye-bye. She left behind And the ones we left behind By the way, Sledgehammer, GET ORDERS IN ZOMBIES! GOD DAMN IT, WHY IS IT STILL NOT THERE? Blah!